about transition design. Um, and the few of us who uh, were following um, Kevin on LinkedIn, we saw this and we were like, oh, okay, let's, that's, that's really interesting. And, and, and we were like, let's try our luck, um, like trying to test our like thick skins. Um, and we reached out and very uh, much to our surprise, um, Cameron responded and met with us to, to talk about what, what's possible for um, working together on, on this series of seminars. And we agreed upon a, a format of, we'll do five sessions. Um, and this one is the second. Uh, where we'll try and see if uh, we can learn theories and methods of transition design from Kevin and see how we can apply it and practice it in uh, service design projects. Because where we are at um, in our program right now, all of us are working on our final major projects uh, in preparation for graduation in uh, November, December period. Um, and I think, uh, so what's happened up to this point is, uh, we've had a, uh, we've had the students who are interested to uh, be part of this put together a short like proposal of their project and we've all shared it with Kevin. We've had a, a kickoff session just to align expectations and then we've had last week we've had our first session where we talked about um, a particular theory um, by Max Neef. Um, it's Max Neef's Matrix of Needs. Um, we had a, bit, a little bit of discussion there. And so this, this second session uh, will be on another piece of theory um, uh, before we yeah, have a little bit of a break for the students to try out these two theories into our projects. And then the next two sessions coming up would be a, like more like a crit session where uh, the students will share how they've tried these things and what they've learned and what's come up from it. And the fifth and final session would be a kind of collective reflection session on you know, what have we learned from this whole thing. And I think sometimes we're all still kind of like in shock that, that this is happening or we get to do this because this this really cool thing that's happening is like it's it's there's no formal agreement or exchange of money and it's really like in the spirit of transition design with experimenting with a different system of exchange that's outside of capitalism. Um, and so in this same spirit, we, we are very happy to also open this series of um, seminars up to um, friends we know, like other guests that who, are, who are, might be interested in transition design as well. So um, yeah, for anyone joining us um, outside of MA Service Design, please, you're, you're very welcome here. Um, if you have any questions, comments, thoughts as well um, during the session, please feel free to type them into chat, um, reach out to us. Um, we have a collaborative like Slack and Miro board no, yeah, as well that we've opened up to anyone who might be interested to browse as well. So yeah, please, please feel free. Um, and um, yeah, uh, the last thing uh, before I hand it over to Cameron is uh, administrative. Um, we are going to be recording these sessions. Uh, so if you're uncomfortable with anything being recorded, please reach out to myself or Alex uh, and we'll, we'll help to manage that. Um, yeah, without, I think, uh, Alex, uh, is there anything else you want to bring in or you want to add? No, let's go. I think we're all ready. Okay, cool. Well, then with that, thank you, Cameron. Over to you. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, and yes, uh, as we were just joking before, I really do appreciate um, everybody being interested and 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 holding this thing up, uh, and um, hoping, you know, as we do it the first time, there are no rituals and there are no kind of like it's not a design service. But having done it a first time, I'm hoping that um, we're creating something where we can kind of learn what what works and what doesn't work and start to sort of formalize it and, and then it will be easier the next time. Um, so you always need these people who are prepared to suffer the social friction of the first time. Uh, and, and I really do appreciate the, that that gift that you're all giving to this. Um, as indicated, I've, I'm, I'm, it, there's, there's a lot going on just here at the moment and I lost a couple of days that I thought I was going to um, pay more attention. So uh, it's it's a little unprepared. 
And it's uh, what I'd like to talk to you about are things that I did start talking about in the first session. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about kind of particular ways of understanding systems um, that I think are really important for doing transition design. And I will speak briefly about the way the, that particular way of understanding systems plays into social practices, which are a core kind of theory used to uh, think about transition design and the way in which that way of thinking about systems in terms of social practices um, is the key to doing the type of visioning that I think is necessary and the way that visioning is quite different from a kind of design fiction or science fiction or futuring or foresighting or, or anything like that. It has a granularity. It's closer to the design fiction than any of those others I just mentioned. But I'm not going to really get time to talk about that. I'm also very mindful that all of you uh, who have been involved um, in the kind of back end have been putting lots of great summaries uh, makes makes the presentation sound a lot more coherent than I think they are um, on the Miro board, and that I have seen the questions that people are asking, um, and was planning to try and incorporate them more into what I was going to talk about. Um, so I'm now going to opt instead for Alex's suggestion that this be more asynchronous. I'll try and get onto the Slack uh, in the coming week. Um, so I've just just been in the middle of doing a kind of project which I'll talk about briefly uh, with a bank around climate risk. I might have mentioned it before and it just went through a sort of very intense phase all of a sudden. So that was why I kind of lost um, my capacity. So I'm, I've got some really terrible slides, uh, even worse than last week, um, that I'm going to share. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm doing justice to uh, transition design by doing this. It always helps to have Terry and kind of uh, working in the background, doing magnificent visual communication design as a Swiss trained typographer. Um, OK, so I'm hoping you can all see UAL systems, practices, visions. Um, OK, so I'll just I'll just run through this. I'll, I'll try and not go as long. It's not as heavy, I think, as last week, I hope. Uh, and so we've got a little more time for sort of um, chatting about things. Um, Obviously, systems thinking is core to transition design because a key way of defining transition design is that you're not simply trying to design a solution to a problem within a given context. You're trying to change the context. So you're trying to shift from system A to system B. This, this language has been appropriated a bit at the moment. I don't know if anyone's familiar with game A, game B, people in the sustainability sort of guru world. Anyway, I, I find them troublesome, but um, I, don't, I don't know if you've come across them, you can Google them in the background. So I shouldn't be using A and B. When I use system A to system B, I'm actually referring to an article by Alain Findelli, the really great uh, French-Canadian, now French resident uh, design theorist, um, who wrote some really important articles on, on design, education, design history, design studies, uh, and talks a lot about what it means to begin designing from system A to system B rather than within a system, but you don't really need to know that. Um, but you do need to recognize that transition design is about transitioning systems. It's it's an attempt to, to work out what can designers contribute to systems level change. Those systems are social systems and socio-technical systems. So systems thinking is core to transition design. Uh, systems thinking sometimes means um, just kind of being systemic or systematic or sometimes holistic, meaning you're sort of looking at the whole. Uh, I think systems thinking is many different things and it should be more than just kind of being systematic or systemic. Um, it mostly manifests in the material artifact of maps. So most of you should have seen the diagram on the right, which was produced by the UK government as a kind of systems map around uh, diabetes, for instance. And it, um, there are very, the good thing about the way it's presented, not just this piece of spaghetti, but the good way it's presented is that it shows linkages between lots of factors. And then in the presentation, 
you see different versions of it that highlight regions in the map. This is the food system, this is exercise system, this is where people live because whether they're walking or not is a factor. This is the medical system. Uh, so it's not just a, a mess, it, it actually has a kind of legend that can be read in a particular way. Um, so systems thinking on the one hand is about seeing the links between things that seemingly are separate. Now, a lot of people who are designers in the more strategic world, wicked problems or just design strategy, design innovation, and a lot in service design are taught that you should always make a system map. And ordinarily they're taught to make a system map at the beginning. So you should do some research, you should work out what your context is, and you should visualize the context and identify how to begin. Where is your starting point? People often use the language of Danella Meadows and say, I'm looking for a leverage point in this system. If I pick the purple, dark purple thing on this uh, obesity map, I'm going to focus on that and it will lead to these flows through the system. But to some extent, that's change within the system. The system is still going to exist as mapped. But I just want to make a couple of like polemical points about this. Uh, the first is, I think it's a bad idea to only make a systems map at the beginning. I think the point about a systems map is that it is a, a model, it's a hypothesis. And so you should be returning to the map and changing it. The map is basically a hypothesis allowing you to do an experiment. And part of what you learn by doing an experiment in a system is whether you've mapped it right. So the map should never be static. It should not just be at the beginning and it should not be static. It should be uh, a living document throughout the project. Uh, it's never particularly useful, I think, to show to clients or stakeholders. I think it's a, a tool for designing, for designing services, for designing transitions, for designing interventions in systems. But um, uh, I think it's really problematic when they're treated as static artifacts. And I think it's problematic when they only occur at the beginning of a project. So as I said, I think a systems map should be treated as a hypothesis. It should be continuously revised. You should be making interventions all the time to determine whether it's right. And then the other thing is that in transition design, you're actually trying to change the system. So you want to make that map redundant. You want to change the relations between the things on the map. You don't want those relations between things to stay the same. So if you've still got the same map at the end of the project, it's kind of a suggestion that you failed to enact a transition. You're trying to move from one system to another, and that will change both the components of the system, what's on the map, and the relation between the components. Things that are not connected are suddenly connected. Things that are connected are disconnected. Things that have positive feedback relations are shifted to negative feedback relations. I'm not going to go into the whole systems thinking language. Um, but I think the whole point about doing these systems mapping, which is only a part of transition design, is to try and make these interventions and see if things are changing. So these should be living documents that are kind of shifting as you intervene. They, they are a guide to whether the transition is happening or not. They're kind of a navigational aid for you as a designer. Uh, the version of systems that is really important to transition design, given that it's trying to make a shift from one socio-technical system to another socio-technical system, is, is the idea that systems have what I'm calling here a locked-in quality, that there is uh, what is referred to in transitions management as a regime. It's a socio-technical regime. It has stability. It has this locked-inness, um, and I'll talk about that in a second, one way in which uh, it gets locked in is not at the really big Danella Meadows version of paradigms, mental models. Rather, things get locked in at the designerly level of material practices. It's everyday routines and habits. 
It's the fact that the rooms we dwell in, whether they're offices, my office here that you're now seeing me in, you know, are filled with artifacts that have object permanence. They all have a finite life, but they're more or less stable and they lock in a bunch of practices. So I am teaching and talking to you partly because I'm talking through stable artifacts that create a habitualized ritual. And so the system manifests at this granular material practice level. So transition design is interested in the system that says systems have a certain lock-in and that lock-in is at something to do with design. So that's the hypothesis. That's why it's transition design, because designers can change systems by changing the material practices that are actually locking in the systems. So that's the kind of hypothesis. That's the difference between transition management or worldview change or, you know, the game A, game B people who are all about changing mindsets and values, social values, all that kind of thing. The difference between them and transition design is that transition design is designly. It's focused on the role everyday material practices have in holding systems in their sameness in the way they get reproduced. So you're going to talk a little bit about this reproduction. This is going to be the most theoretical stuff. And it's kind of, I find it interesting, but um, you actually don't really need to understand the philosophy that I'm about to explain very badly. The locked-in quality of a system is sometimes counterintuitive because we ordinarily think of systems as flows. So Danella Meadows' language is stocks and flows. You know, if you kind of look at a diagram like this, it's a whole bunch of things that look, because they're arrows, like it's dynamic, it's flowing. So a lot of people sort of think about systems as, as kind of verbal, and that means that it's hard for them to notice that what's really interesting about the system is despite them being dynamic and processual, there is this locked in quality. <clears throat> So one way to understand this is to think about yourself. So you are a system. You are a system of relations between a whole bunch of subsystems, um, organs, uh, all the way down to cells, uh, things within cells. Uh, so you are a whole bunch of relations. And you are you. You have some identity permanence. You uh, are identifiable as who you are because of the relations between things in your body. And it's very important that your identity is in the relations because the parts of your body are being replaced all the time. So I think I might have said this a few weeks ago, but you know, you 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 are not materially you. You are the the ship of Thebes, the famous example of the ship that's sailing down the river and you take a plank off and you put a new plank in that place and then you take a new plank and you put a new plank and eventually you'll have two ship of Thebes, you'll have the old ship and the new ship and you ask this identity question, which one's the real ship? So you are that, you've had all the cells in your body replaced over the last 10 years. You're, you're a materially completely different entity, but obviously you are you. And it's the same thing, obviously, for organisations, corporations. So here I am at the University of Technology, Sydney. And if I was to say something terrible about the way our vice chancellor is currently running the university, which is something that I do say quite frequently, I might lose my job. And uh, unfortunately, I could hope that UTS would crumble if this very vital part of UTS was no longer here, but it's not true. UTS would just continue. UTS is an organization, it's a system, and it's a system of relations that has swap outable parts. In this case, academics, students, furniture, computer systems, Microsoft Teams, et cetera. Right? So it's very important to kind of get this sense. Uh, and by the way, you know, this, this is also why service design is always organizational design. And again, I, I think I'm repeating something I said to you before, but service design is the design of a service. You're trying to make service regular. I basically said there's, there's care between people who know each other, and then there are services between strangers, and those services have some regularity that's been organized. So the job of the service designer is to organize the delivery of the service so that it happens with some performance expectations. So it happens in a regular fashion 
so the job of a service designer is to organize a service, which normally means putting the service in an organization, an organization that holds the service regular, which is why services are triadic and not just dyadic between service provider and service recipient. Okay, so that's an example of this kind of systems thinking. Now, this is where it sort of gets slightly technical. I don't know if anybody's come across the work of Humberto Maturana and Francisco Varela. Uh, Humberto Maturana just died uh, last year, I think, and Francisco Varela died uh, um, uh, quite a few years before that. They are Chilean uh, biologists, cognitive biologists. Varela started becoming very interested in concepts of the inner life and found really interesting bridges between cognitive science and Buddhism, for example. Um, Humberto Maturana um, was a biologist and started thinking about systems and was a systems thinking, dynamic systems thinking theorist uh, and also a marriage therapist because marriage is a type of system between components as a set of relations and some people like to hope that that system can be maintaining of its identity rather than falling apart. And so you go and see a, a marriage therapist. So I think it's just really interesting to notice that about Humberto Maturana and Francisco Varela. They wrote some very technical books. The Tree of Knowledge, the one I've got here on the screen, is an attempt to almost write a textbook, like a feels and reads, like a school textbook, uh, explaining how they think about biological systems and how that enables you to understand uh, love, language, and society. And it's a really interesting book. I highly recommend you read it. But I only want to pull one thing out of it, which is if a system is a set of relations that constitute an observable, sustained identity, even though the parts are replaced, this is referred to using a kind of Greek portmanteur, a new word created, it's not a word the Greeks ever used, autopoesis. Poesis means making and auto means self. So it's self-making. So a living system doesn't just do something, a machine just does something, right? So uh, if I have a uh, washing machine, I can put clothes in and then it does something and clean clothes, clean wet clothes come out the back of it, right? out the front of it. You put it in the front, you take them out the front, but out the back of the process. So systems do something, but living systems, in addition, reproduce themselves. Living systems produce their own system quality. They produce their own components. So you are a system, and part of the job of your system is remaking the organs that are your brain and your heart and your kidneys and your liver and your skin, right? So you are a system that's making itself all the time. And just to kind of get this thought, according to Maturana and Varela, if you think about a living system, what it does is actually just a side effect of its reproducing itself. So the fact that you are engaged in a Masters of Service Design at UAL is in fact just a side product of the fact that you are reproducing your own organs. You sometimes think that your whole purpose in life is to study at UAL. From a biological point of view, you are just reproducing your own organs uh, in order to live, and it just so happens that that system also does something. Now, this is kind of important. It's kind of interesting to think about in terms of philosophy of biology, and I'm not doing it justice, but it's important to think about um, in terms of transition design, because it goes to the regularity of a system, which is exactly what a transition designer is trying to change. They're trying to shift the system. They're trying to deregularize it. So the first thing is just to, to recognize that most systems that are complex are nested systems. They're systems of systems. I just stuck up this uh, kind of military text here just as a way of kind of making that point. So. You are a system, your heart is a system, your blood is a system, the cells in the blood are a system. Uh, they're, they're all these nested systems. And they're not just nested like babushka dolls, they're actually also a whole bunch of adjacent systems. So red cells and white cells are next to that, and that's next to the plasma and, and all these other kind of components. And the blood is next to the digestive system and the like. It's, it's that. In the same way, 
that you have breakfast and while you're having breakfast, you might listen to the news on the radio. Don't know if anybody does that anymore. I still do it. Um, or read a newspaper. That's definitely something that's disappeared. So you have breakfast and you read a newspaper and then you commute and you go to school or you go to work and then you have lunch and then you have a meeting. So there are all these systems next to each other. And this is important because all those systems are trying to reproduce themselves. And if you're trying to transition a system, you have to recognize that you are working against the fact that all those systems are trying to reproduce themselves. So if you change one system, it's going to impact the systems that are next to it. It's going to impact the systems that it's a part of. So this is why you start to get system change, right? So you start to get a diagram like this which is showing it's a system of systems. Some of these systems are food systems, some of them are exercise systems, some of them are transport systems, some of them are health systems. And each of those systems comprises a bunch of components. The health system has doctors and nurses and medical equipment and a whole bunch of education and training and a whole bunch of pharmaceutical companies. So there are all these systems. And they're all cooperating and when you see a diagram like this, it looks like there are things flowing between them that hold them together. But this is the reason why I wanted to just mention Maturana and Varela, because autopoiesis indicates that systems are codependent. They're like the two circles here. There are, there are things that go back and forth between them. But, and this is the conceptually difficult thing to try and understand, from the point of view of the system, each individual system, all it's doing is reproducing itself. So in Maturana of Varela's understanding of systems thinking, autopoetic systems are always, in terms of their reproduction, closed. They are self-referential. If from an outside perspective, it looks like there are two systems adjacent and dependent. That is an observed relation by us outside. It is not how the system on the inside is experienced. Now, again, this is not really relevant to transitions. I'm trying to explain this um, quickly, but uh, I'll try and do it in a strange way because we're talking virtually. I want you to all um, right, stop writing if you're writing, and I want you to get your finger and I want you to get your finger and I want you to touch a physical surface in front of you. And I want you to rub your finger on a physical surface. So I'm, I'm, I'm rubbing it on the brushed aluminium. And I want you to think about the way in which you can feel the quality of the surface. In a weird way, your whole phenomenological experience is now at the tip of your finger feeling that material surface. You're kind of there. You're not hear me talking to you, you're right there. And the weird thing is, sorry, if you can just all now grab a pen, if you have a pen, and now touch the same surface with the pen, right? So now you're touching the surface with the pen. You can still feel the quality of that surface. But you are not there, right? So you can still feel, if you move it to a different quality surface, so you're, I'm touching brush metal, now I'm touching the formica, now I'm touching paper, I can feel the material quality of those things. But I'm not touching them, but it feels like I'm touching them. I feel like I'm actually touching them. Now, when you touch something, you get this sense that what's happening is something of the world is communicating up your nerves to your brain. But there's nothing of the outside world that's passing into you. There is nothing passing in. There is some disturbance on the outside, and it's disturbing a bunch of nerve cells that are just reproducing themselves. And those nerve cells are next to other nerve cells, and the disturbance in the one cell is disturbing the next cell and disturbing the next cell, and all these cells are being disturbed until it gets up to your brain, and now your brain's got a disturbance in it. There is no bit of the outside world flowing into your brain, right? 
So that's like saying these systems are related, they are touching, they can sense each other, but there's nothing actually moving between them. So this is characterized in autopoiesis as structural coupling. And I said this to you a couple of weeks ago, I told you about Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, and then somebody got a great photo and stuck it on the Miro page, because I think some of you didn't know who Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers was. So somebody put a photo there, which is fantastic. But, you know, Ginger Rogers has to do all the dancing backwards and in heels that Fred Astaire does. They're two separate systems. They're coupled, they're in a situation of dependence, but from the inside of Ginger Rogers, all Ginger Rogers is doing is reproducing herself in the same way that this nerve cell is just a closed system. So that's this diagram here. The system is reproducing itself in the circle and just happens to be in a dynamic relation to another system. And then the wobbly line down the bottom is the environment, the fluctuations in the environment. OK, I didn't explain that very well. You can have a look at it. It's a really interesting thing to try and conceptually understand. The reason I tell you that is that one of the most important things about doing transition design when you do system maps is to notice the distinctness of those subsystems, those holons that are reproducing themselves, to think about them as being distinct. One of the dangers of a systems map, and in this case I've got a, a giga map, as it's known from the systemic design group, um, originally based in OCAD and now having a very successful conference around the world, their students often make these giant maps. And between you and me, I really hate these maps because they make a whole bunch of different things feel the same to me. They make completely different because they've got a sort of uniform aesthetic, a somewhat, you know, uh, soft modernism, I would call it, a slightly soft color palette modernism. They're clean. Um, they're using a particular kind of infographic language and they've got arrows and diagrams. And I don't know how you read diagrams like this. Supposedly, you could go in at the details and work out what this infographic is showing. But I think one of the dangers of this is that it makes, you can see a brain sort of top third and a building and a city and a diagram, maybe a stakeholder map. It has this danger of what I'm calling flattening everything into the same. Systems have relation between different things, but what's really important in transition design is to recognize that those systems have distinctiveness. They have their own particular values that they are trying to reproduce. And if you're gonna try and change them, you're gonna to have to try and change not all of them, but at least the ones that are around, encompassing or adjacent to the system you're trying to change. Okay, so the systems thinking that's important to transition design is not the kind of just the holistic, everything is connected. It's in fact the recognition that there are subsystems which are unique and structurally coupled, dancing, but are actually focused on reproducing themselves. Now, it's a bit of a conceptual leap, and it's not quite true philosophically or theoretically, but it does for practice to think that what is distinctive about a subsystem is its material practice. That in a diagram like this, so if you just take the kind of journey map that's in the middle there, they're tied together by the customer experiencing each particular moment. I can't even remember what this is showing. It seems to be a stroke patient. So there's each of these particular moment. There is a customer journey, and the customer is supposedly the thing like the piece of information going from the material up your arm into your brain. The customer feels like it's the thing that's moving through the system. But all those stages are completely unique subsystems, and they each have their own set of materials, competencies, and meanings. So this is Elizabeth Shove's version of uh, social practice theory. Um, 
which is uh, sort of connected to the work of uh, Shatsky and Reckwitz, and uh, which in turn comes from like Wittgenstein and Heidegger. Um, so this is a particular account of society that says society is a series of material practices. So in the example on the screen, this is a breakfasting practice. Breakfast is uh, a set of things, food, beverages, condiments, shops, recipes, kitchens. It's a set of things which are more or less stable. But things are useless unless you have skills in knowing how to do them, how to store, prepare, cook, eat breakfast, right? How to actually do the verbal activity. And the verbal activity connects to the materials, the objects, because you have some particular qualities that you're pursuing and those qualities tend to be social. So it's a social material practice and it locks together, even though there's three components, they're locked together as a constellation which holds itself together in a particular way. So a subsystem, a whole on, which makes systems stay the same, are that each component has a kind of stable material practice that's reproducing itself. That's how we sort of combine autopoiesis living system reproduction with material practice as what a subsystem is. Now that's all quite abstract. I'll see if I can just, that was a quick illustration just to show you that breakfast, um, you know, toast requires you to have access to sliced bread and bread, which you might come from a bread maker and you need to have like plates. It's a whole ecosystem. It's a product ecosystem. It's a material ecology. It connects you to a bunch of infrastructures. Um, and it occurs in a particular place. This is always my favorite example for this. I don't know if you've ever he heard me do the stand-up routine about this. So this is a kind of classic product design student's joke. It is an alarm clock that wakes you to the smell of bacon. Um, now, it's a classic design school thesis project joke because... Uh, first of all, it's offensive to anybody who um, doesn't eat pork, which is a considerable amount of the Muslim and Jewish population, for example. Uh, and secondly, you know, you would use this thing once and then your entire bedroom would smell smoky and greasy because you have uh, linen. You know, you have you just don't do breakfasting. You don't cook food in your bedroom. It's going to be a terrible idea. So practices have their own environments or what Shatsky calls um, time spaces. They have their own time spaces. And when you take a product and put it in another time space, uh, it often won't lead to an innovation because it just doesn't fit. So again, if you know this dated piece of television, you know that this man is um, on the Segway is a bit of a jerk. And that's precisely what he's using this Segway as a prop to signify his jerkness because only jerks drive Segways because they don't belong on the road. They don't belong on the sidewalk. They're a kind of, they're a product without an ecosystem. Eventually somebody made an ecosystem for them, which is uh, embarrassed tourists or security guards running around airports, for example. But uh, this was supposed to be a transport revolution. This, when this product was released, um, it was supposed to be a transition in cities. It was going to be a complete transition. Uh, and it totally failed to understand the nature of nested systems and material practices. So that's why I'm kind of telling you this. So if you're going to plan a transition from one system to another, you need to work out how changing one system is going to change the systems that are either side of it or the practices that are either side of it. And the illustration here is Indy Young's first book on mental models, which is a, a weird term for it because mental models mean something else in a completely different world. But a mental model is just if you go and ask somebody to describe their practices, in this case, you've got somebody getting dressed and awakening themselves and eating and commuting a series of adjacent practices. And those practices contain particular activities, getting out of bed, washing up, brushing teeth, and they've ordered them. What I think is interesting about the way they've ordered them is that they get dressed still half asleep in this particular story. That's what this data is showing you, because they only awaken themselves after getting dressed. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Um, and then there are all these products associated with it. Now, if you're going to change eating, if you're going to try and do a transition to get people to be vegetarian so that they're not cooking bacon in their breakfast, Right. If you're going to try and just do a transition in the eating system, 
not only are you going to have to change food systems where people get their food, develop a whole bunch of new rituals and practices so that people are skilled in preparing a vegetarian breakfast, let's say, if they're not used to it. You're going to have to change that practice. But your transition is not going to be a transition and not a transition to the whole system unless you also recognise that your changing of the practice of eating will also impact the commuting because it just might take a little longer to have breakfast or because it doesn't take longer because they can actually get two tasks done at once now that they're a vegetarian. That would be a good Max Neef synergetic, synergy, synergic satisfier to accomplish a couple of need satisfiers in the one moment. So you will be transitioning the system because you've transitioned a subsystem and noticed the adjacent and nested systems which won't just change naturally. Right? It's not organic. It doesn't, it's not like a leverage point. You just, you just do acupuncture here and it flows through the whole system. The transition designer takes responsibility for the adjacent nested practices that need to be changed. Okay, so i just give you two quick examples, both of which come from me having worked with a bank. They were two different projects. One was a while ago where everybody was um, working out the blockchain was going to save the world. And if you remember that great moment, thank goodness it's gone away. Do, do you remember that moment in which, like, blockchain it, and it's, we're going to fix finance and poverty and f food systems and modern slavery? It's all just it's blockchain. So the bank at some point was doing its innovation centre. It had this idea that uh, to preserve biodiversity, Sometimes a developer in one place wants to knock down a bunch of trees, and so they need to then get an offset. Right? It's a bank, so they're thinking about offsets, costs and benefits, etc. And the offset is that they might preserve a frog over here. So they wanted to work out a system in which they could sell, they're a bank, so they're all about facilitating transactions, they could sell this frog over here which is endangered and being preserved, this could be bought by the developer over here as an offset for them chopping down trees. It's a terrible project. Right? I totally opposed to all of it. It's not really a good example of a transition design. But they wanted to work out how you could do this. Now, you could draw a system map and you would start to realise that there were all these different, I've named them as kind of stakeholders, but they're actually names of practices. They're names of subsystems. And if you're going to make a transition that allows biodiversity offsets, you're going to have to somehow structurally couple all these people. And you could draw a system map and you could be from McKinsey and you walk in with your, uh, your, your map and say, here's my systems map. You want to do bio token. You're going to have to change all these systems. We can help you pay us a lot of money. Uh, but that map will be like a giga map in which all these things look the same. What's missing is the thing the designer would notice, which is that an ecologist is a very particular type of person with a particular bunch of gear who likes to get out into a field and throw squares onto a piece of grass and then count every single species in that piece of grass. And the ecologist has no interest in a developer whatsoever, but you need the ecologist to do their job of finding the frog. It's no good finding the frog. You've then got to check that it's endangered, identify it. And so there's going to be some canon of certification. The canon of certification is a completely different material practice to the guy or woman in the field throwing squares and counting frogs. It's close to, it's adjacent. Those people talk to each other. There's a flow. They're like two balls talking to each other. But they're totally different systems. Blockchain is a whole different system, a bunch of nerds, you know, talking about ledgers and, and uh, uh, things like that. They, they sound like a similar practice to certifiers, but they're not. It's a totally different system, normally paper-based, you know, really based in, in museums and canonical figures so that you can do identification of species versus blockchain versus finance versus the developer and the builder and the actual person who's investing in the whole thing trying to get the building built. So if you're going to make this system in which we would supposedly transition to recognising that every developer who's about to destroy a piece of nature 
needs to somehow also invest in rebuilding nature somewhere else. So it's a type of uh, um, not quite regenerative design, but it's a type of if I'm going to do something here, I'm going to benefit somewhere else. If you're going to create that system, you have to somehow system link all these systems. And as a designer, you're going to have to go in and look at all those distinct material practices. So the other example at the moment is that I'm trying to help the bank think about climate risk. Uh, you have climate scientists doing a whole bunch of models. Climate scientists look and sound a bit similar to actuaries in the insurance industry, sort of mathematicians in, in finance, financial engineering, but they're totally different. You have reinsurers. Reinsurers are uh, people, who, uh, companies that insure insurance companies. They have a completely different way of thinking. Governments, planners, valuers, all the way down to mortgagees. The whole point of this project is to help households recognise that in changing climate, suddenly they can't afford home insurance. So suddenly the bank doesn't want to give them a mortgage anymore because they can't afford home insurance. And so somehow they need to do something to their house. Uh, they need to move or they need to improve the quality of the house, put it on stilts so that it doesn't get flooded or make it fire protected or something. But if you're going to make this transition, if you're going to recognise that climate risk is a landscape pressure on the socio-technical regime of home lending right now, you're going to have to sound, find some way to structurally couple these subsystems. The way to do this, by the way, is not to try and get a climate scientist, an actuary, a reinsurer, a government planner, all in the one room. I mean, you could do that, it would be interesting, but this is not, that's like thinking that I can, when I touch the brushed metal, there's actually flow through. It's not necessary to have all these people agree, it's not consensus, it's structural coupling. It's the fact that these, each, individual systems which each have their own governing value and material practices so actuaries are people who love numbers and spreadsheets and they love seeing uh, algorithms sort of give results they love being able to quantify it's no use going to an actuary and telling them about a, a, a household that still hasn't been able to uh, go back to their flooded out house because an insurer hasn't paid off on it that they don't care about that but it's not just that they don't care about it it's that it's not in their world it's, it's it's not in the reproductive system of what they value and their material practices you just can't bring somebody suffering from a flooded house actually into the practice of an actuary if you did there'd be a totally different practice it'd neither be flood victim or actuary it'd be something completely different so it's not about getting these people to have the same world view. It's instead about uh, structurally coupling the system and noticing all its different components. Um, the, now here's a ridiculous sort of trick or tip. It's ridiculous because it's impossible to do. We have noticed when trying to do transition designs and when looking at other things, that weren't transition designs, but were transitions, and you can kind of read the design pieces of them. So when you look at those case studies, often the transition is the result of an unexpected thing that you haven't put on the system map, because the system map only has all the things that are relevant to diabetes or to biotoken or to climate risk. But all of a sudden there's something else and it starts to structurally couple. So it's a bit like a third dimension. If you imagine you've got a map and you've got all these things on the map, something else comes and it starts to influence a component, not to do with its own dependencies, but an external, and it changes that subsystem. So it's a stupid trick or tip because what it means is whenever you make a systems map, you need to map what I'm calling not within system practice systems, which of course is an infinite set, right? Now that's why transition designers have to be really diversely connected, curious, constantly looking at unexpected things, people, which is hard because we've got so many things we need to transition. You, you have to be really focused on the one hand. And on the other hand, you need to be constantly looking out for like, um, oh, there's something over here. Oh, there's something over there. 
Uh, it's not within the system, but it actually helps um, change the system. So it just has to do with this sort of structural coupling and things that cause requisite varieties that sometimes called within a system or, you know, that begin to kind of modify it. Requisite varieties, a wrong use of that term. Um, all right, and then this is, as I said, really briefly just to finish, and I'm not going to explain this, I'm just kind of telling it to you if I've explained anything this evening. Um, when you do visioning, because transition design is vision-led designing, which is also something that makes it quite different to agile or you know any kind of system that's just trying to innovate incrementally, often when people start visioning, they will pick an abstract value, right? So a world in which everybody is commoning, a world in which uh, meat has disappeared, a world in which there are no more cars, that, uh, a world in which um, there is a lot of uh, um, a caring economy is the dominant economy. So that they'll often pick something big or abstract as the need satisfier by which to imagine a, a totally different preferential system. However you start, you can start that way. The one recommendation I would have, which ties to everything I've been saying tonight um, or, or morning in your time, is you have to get to the granularity of the practice. You have to think about one subsystem. So even if you're trying to think about people no longer consuming meat, you have to pick breakfast. Or if you're trying to think about people not having cars, you need to think about the practice of taking kids to school, or better, actually, is taking kids to some weekend event. Obviously, in a completely adjusted system, we might have not have kind of weekend sport versus education, but just pick some particular practice and imagine that practice happening in a completely different way and think about the material qualities that would be associated with the practice, the things, the skills, the meanings. And they would be totally new meanings, not efficiency and comfort, not safety, that, that, that you would again use your kind of Max Neef matrix to begin thinking, okay, there's there's this practice and it's going to be completely different. And if you can just get that one feeling plausibly distinct, the trick is then to say, okay, what are the adjacent practices just around it, nested around it, within it? You know, if people are transporting their kids to something on the weekend that's not school, what are the kids doing in the transport while they do it? What clothes did the kids have to put on to get to the transport to go to the location? What did the parents have to think about in terms of food while doing it? So you're doing a transport transition system, you're focusing on some particular transport moment, but then notice the practices around Imagine them adjusting and tell that story. So this is a, a tip kind of taken from Julian Bleeker's work and, and colleagues at the Near Future Laboratory. Don't focus on the thing you're trying to vision. Don't forget, a, don't have a background, allude to the background, right? You need to have some landscape in which it's happening. But the story should focus on what I'm calling the mid-ground here. The story should focus on the adjacent practices. Along the way, the practice that you're actually talking about will be apparent to whoever's encountering your story, your performance, your video, whatever it is, your, your, your way of depicting the system. But show the things around because that's where you start to see system level change. But you're not seeing systems level change as just an abstract, oh, we're all suddenly communing in a vegetarian utopia. You're focusing in particular on how transport happens, but you don't focus only on that, you tell the story around it. So these are all sort of dramaturgical tips for doing visioning, and they help get at what I've been trying to explain tonight, which is that system change is, is the change to the reproduction of systems, which is what holds these regimes in place. And if you're trying to get from system A to system B, 
you change subsystem one to subsystem two, but you can only change subsystem one to a subsystem two by changing all the systems that are adjacent and nested around subsystem one, which is what will lead to a change. It's not a ripple effect. It's not a butterfly effect. It is that you have prefigured what in transition management is called a bounded socio-technical experiment. You've done a living lab in which people have worked out that they can adopt that transport practice. And that transport practice is something that fits in a new world. And the rest of the world will begin to adjust around it and you'll have to keep designing to help them sustain the practice that you've successfully designed within system A. But that got kind of complicated there. I probably lost you. Um, so that's systems, practices, and visioning. Uh, I hope that was vaguely understandable and I'm really happy to kind of answer questions on that incoherent talk. And I'm going to check the chat while you take a breath. Alex has a nice filmography and uh, taste regime, according to my judgment, just by the way. This is evidencing a nice, uh, we have overlaps there, so. Oh, I'm hoping the person who is silent is no longer silent. Excellent, yes, yes. I, I'm trying to make my children misspend their youth. My daughter is uh, doing, is just matriculating from uh, school and she had to do a major project for English. And I'm very proud that she made a short homage to uh, Wes Anderson, who's hardly independent. But um, anyway, the, the embarrassing thing is that uh, I am the lead actor in that particular Wes Anderson. I could share it with you, but I'm not sure. I should. Should. I'll ask her permission and then I'll share it with you. It's, it's a ridiculous little project. Um, okay, what uh, what are you thinking? It was complicated stuff. Yeah. Any uh, so firstly, thank you very much for the lecture. This is all good stuff and this is very much kind of my major project this far, <laughs> to be very honest. Also, please share the thing. Uh, yeah. with you being the lead actor, that would be awesome. Uh, so I, I basically have like a whole barrage of questions. So I'm going to ask them kind of one at a time Yep. Uh, to make sure that other questions are being asked. Um, so I, I guess my first one will be kind of um, clarifying. So when you talk in your example of like the actuary doesn't understand the suffering of the flooding victim, to what extent does that mean that the job of the service designer or transition designer in this context is essentially that of a translator? So if we want to get the system going, we need to figure out the language of the actuary and try and figure out how to get them to also get on board of the problem. Kind of, I, I want to understand more the mechanics of the approaches to the structural coupling that you were talking yep. about. Like, like, are we talking about the same thing or are those different processes? Not, not quite. Um, so it's definitely the job of the designer, to, which is the ridiculous brief of being a transition designer, that you have to be a, a Babel fish, which is another obscure reference to a, a universal translation device in which you can go you know, and understand the language of actuaries and understand the language of climate suffering and understand the language of banks. And that, that's an impossible ask. And it gets even more impossible. It's not the designer's magic job to work out how to get uh, the suffering of a household into the head of an actuary. The only thing you need to do is work out how the actuarial practice needs to be modified so that the overall system begins to pay attention to the suffering of the um, person in a flood. It, it's, it's, so translation is not quite the right metaphor because translation still suggests it's kind of like touching your finger and going into your brain. Um, it's a matter of 
working out what it is within the reproducing system of the actuary that can be changed and could be changed so that inputs and outputs um, are being processed by it in a way which is leading to uh, better heeding of climate risk, which at the moment isn't happening. So I haven't explained that very well, but it's 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 um, it's a it, it's precisely that you are trying to work out how can I re how can we together because you won't be able to do it yourself, but how can actuaries and I co-design their practice into some transformed form, but it's not necessary that they think they are doing it for the purpose of suffering. And it might be that that would be a completely wrong way to do it and that, that they would get frust frustrated or that you'd totally misdirect it. So it is a dancing kind of... The other way to think about it is if you think about cogs connecting in a machine... If you if you wanted to to change one cog, it will impact another cog, but it doesn't. It's not like they have to. It's not like you're doing translation between them. You've just found things that fit with their system that make them go slower or faster. So it doesn't kind of matter what I'm trying to explain, it's it's a different approach to systems change in which you're recognising that the designer's job as a transition designer is just to be paying more attention to distinct material practices and not to think like you can just make everybody get on the same page. So that's more important than, it might be that you could actually get an actuary to kind of like empathise with the household. The point of the story is notice all these distinct systems and recognise that you've got lots of different design jobs to do uh, in order to try and get these coordinations. And again, it's not a master coordinator. That's why I said at the beginning, it's kind of an, the map is constantly changing and you can never be sure that you've understood the systems. Maturana and Varela make this nice point, which is you always need to remember that any system is only a system because it's being observed. So that it's a bit like Maggie Thatcher saying there is no society. A system is the effect of an observation of what's happening between a bunch of components. So that's why I say it doesn't really, it's, it's not a job of kind of tricking the actuaries or convincing the actuaries. It's a matter of changing the actuaries. I don't know if that, ex that helps explain. Yes, thank you, but I will need to think. Yeah, <laughs> okay. It, it, like, like, uh, big because like changing the actuaries, but then if we're not do convincing them or tricking them, then how do we do it? Do we make different forms? Like, sorry, this, yep, this is just... Yep, yep. No, no, so you, you, you quite literally kind of take the... Um, the, you know, something like shows material practice triangle and you say, yeah, okay, so we, we give them a different interface for the spreadsheet. We think about the way in which uh, we teach them some new skills about ways of quantifying different types of things. Like you really pay attention to the material quality of each system and you don't have any sense that they all have some unifying governing value, which is comfort or convenience or efficiency or profit or, or you know, they just or climate like it's just it's a matter of being an ethnographer for each individual system or having a team of people who un, who can be ethnographers in each system and you're changing this i'm changing this one we're co-designing with these people you're co-designing with that we're in an alliance and it's not like we are the master translators it's just that we are also sharing what's happening in that system. I've observed this system changing. I'm observing this system changing. It looks like it's making this possibility. So it's that kind of coordinated, coordinated without being controlling is the ambition. Thank you. Uh, Ada? Hi, yeah. Um, first, I wanted to thank you. This was uh, really enlightening and I I personally found really interesting what you were talking about adjacent practices and how to change that to change the system because I kind of I'm kind of in that point in my project and seeing that in order to 
promote more regenerative practices in farming, I might not be changing something in the practice themselves, but actually in how this is consumed in different ways, et cetera, right? Yep. Um, but I had a question on visualization because um, you talked about how, you know, like you showed that map that was flattened and like I was thinking like how do you visualize a map with subsystems that are adjacent, nested, but have their own self-sufficiency within them. Yep. And then also like even if they're, even if we go beyond maps, maybe there's two questions, right? This first one of how would you visualize a map in transition design? And then the second one, at the beginning, you were talking about maps being the material representation of systems. And, and I wanted to ask you if you've encountered with examples of, of these visualizations beyond maps, because I sometimes find them that they become so big, but like, is there any other materialization of, of a system beyond a map? Um, so, so it's a great question and, and I always think when I'm trying to talk to design schools, particularly design schools that are, have a real kind of material craft background, I'm always trying to get them excited in that, like trying to get through all the kind of theory and ambition about transition design and just say, there are so many really exciting things that we need to be visualising differently right now. Can you all just start experimenting wildly with with working out how to visualize these things and so just as you were talking I was I was thinking it's a bit like the you know what I'm looking at now sometimes I uh, I want a kind of systems map that looks more like uh, you know a zoom or a team screen in which it's clear that all these people are in the same system but they're all in completely different places doing different things and they're all doing their own little thing. So it's like a multi-screen map in which they each had their own aesthetic. We're, we're somewhat being flattened by uh, Microsoft here, but, but you know, people have different like depth of field and focus and, and equipment. So you get a sense we're the same, but we're different. And I always want a systems map not to have that flattened same aesthetic, but to be without being too noisy, a jumble of different aesthetics. And I think that would be a really interesting kind of visualization. The, the only other technique is um, just, just kind of call outs and zooms. I think anytime you kind of have a map, uh, it can't, it, there's always too much information. The, the reason you do it is to try and get lots of information in one space, because that's, you're trying to think systemically in that way or holistically, but, um, you can only read it by zooming in. And even as a reader, you have to kind of like, okay, I'm now reading this bit and this bit. So you can help somebody by literally zooming. But when you zoom, it's not like you're only seeing the same aesthetic at a granular. It's like all of a sudden it snaps into a completely different aesthetic. And I'm now in a graphic novel about what it means to be an actuary. And I'm in the world of spreadsheets and people just trying to work out numbers and there's there's probability and they've got dice on their table because there's somebody who doesn't ever go to a casino because they know that you can never win. And like there's that whole quality there. So we were doing a project in which we tried to help an educational institution do a kind of vision led designing and it was a challenge to architecture because it wasn't just about program. The, here's a classroom and here's a meeting room and here's a lunch room. We wanted it to be activity based. We wanted to think about practices. And so we actually had a student uh, here do little graphic novel vignettes of a student kind of talking to a teacher on an escalator going down. And it was very noisy. Like we wanted to allow the people who were commissioning the building see that the architects had made a very noisy space. And that might not be, might be a good thing, might be a bad thing. We didn't want to judge, but we, we just had these kind of graphic novel pullouts that I think really effectively captured. And they each had a distinct aesthetic. The students were kind of bringing distinct aesthetics to those little bits. So you had this, you had to die, like an architectural plan but then when you kind of went into the plan, it would snap into a kind of manually, you know, we were just clicking through the presentation and you would suddenly see a vignette of somebody who had mental health issues and needed a quiet space and they were trying to get to the quiet space from the loud. 
room and somebody trying to talk to a teacher and somebody you know a whole bunch of people waiting outside a classroom trying to get into a classroom and so we just tried to capture those it, excellent so yes yes um using yeah yeah scott mcleod's kind of stuff for example yeah uh marla hi hi um thank you for the talk uh I, it was interesting because I come from different philosophies, but at some points concepts uh, encounter. Um, but I was thinking, I, I was stuck in your beginning where you said that map, maps are useful. I use, I use also, are useful also to do later on, not just the beginning. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to add uh, that for me the interesting thing is not the map, but the mapping. Yeah. Okay. Um, and if you can do that collaborative uh, with different people and different elements uh, that maintain that uh, map alive, and it also makes you um, support better than noticing yeah. that trick at the end of the talk yeah. or or the blocking the theories into the trick of noticing something else that yeah. is affecting the systems. Uh, it, uh, it's very useful to do the mapping with different yeah. peoples, with different elements, with different layers, and that mapping sometimes is impossible to present very beautiful as your major project yeah. because it's made with stuff that you see in the room with the people, yeah. whoever you're working with. Yeah. Um, so for me, uh, the maps also have a, a lot of charge of the colonial capitalist yeah, yeah, things yeah. that we wanted to escape yeah. um so for me it's more interesting to map and i push myself in my projects to map with other ways of not visual representations and yeah. my inspirations usually are the um pacific maps that are in yeah. a stick I, I don't know if yeah. you have seen yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But I don't, for the other students, I don't know, it's like a stick that has the shape of the coast and navigators in the Pacific use it. And it's very useful because you don't need electricity, you don't need to see, you just feel where is the coast and where are you. Um, so I, you, I try to have that as my inspiration and always try to find different ways to map the systems yeah. where I'm and the practices where I'm trying to operate. Yeah. Um, no, no, that's, that's, that's a beautiful point. And uh, it, it's a great point precisely, I think, as you were kind of indicating, if I can play it back to make sure I heard it right, that when you map with, you get two advantages. One is that uh, there will be insights that you will get and they will get because you are making them map their own, their own thing. But the resulting map, if you're doing that, mapping with with different groups the resulting map will be a collage because they will each map yes. in their own way and i think that's the other thing like i think it's a little bit dangerous sometimes if designers have like a box of things and they turn up and they say we're now going to map with these things uh and then they take the box to all the different places i think it's almost more interesting to kind of go to a place and say what can you map with that is exactly. of this place already um, and it's quite true. Yeah, yeah. And it, 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 if, if you want to read some interesting work that makes use of these Pacific maps, uh, uh, um, Lucy Suchman's early work, uh, Plans and Situated Actions, makes this, this situated action. One of the other things about those Pacific Island navigation maps is they, they don't have uh, an up or down that you, you – you can only read them where you are. So if you're here, you feel the map this way and it suggests where to go next. Yes. But it, they're not a 50,000 foot picture. They're, they're, yeah. a, they're a picture of the experience from within. So it's a great great point. Those are great points. Thanks for, thanks for making them. Um, Damien, you also had a long comment. I, yeah, I had a question, and I, I think I'm realizing my question is more like um, I'm hoping to play back some of the like I'm, what I feel like I'm hearing is the key ideas you're trying to communicate to us in these two sessions that uh, we've heard so far. Um, so I'm 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 hearing that well for for the previous session in, uh, with Max Neve like there's a there's an underlying idea to kind of recommend us to change our designers' worldview from 
Athenian hierarchical one because of how popular Maslow's hierarchy is, um, uh, to one that to considering needs and satisfiers as sort of coupled and non-hierarchical, and to design for more than just single needs and to avoid those false needs or destroyers. Um, and that's that that for me like the biggest thing that's coming up for the session, the big change in idea. And for this one, I'm hearing that it's more about sh changing, shifting our idea of systems change from the idea of an acupuncture point, like how Dole Donella Meadow describes it, like leverage points where we can shift one thing and it ripples out into the system to looking at systems change more as changing the material practices that hold systems in place or like to hold them like um, and how they live uh, basically um, yep. and in that way changing the way subsystems can be structurally coupled with each other in those material practices um, and I was just hoping you kind of play this back and check if I'm understanding or hearing things right yep. um, this no, that, yeah yeah no that sounds that sounds perfect I think that's right I think you know the the summaries are always situated action in in the way we just talked about it so always like uh, trying to help a system transition by paying attention to the subsystems and working with them and if you do that you're not using an abstracted version of need that might be universal across all the subsystems you're recognizing the need satisfiers that are within each kind of system and there's an even more radical version of of what's underlying this that you've been alluding to uh, so some social practice theorists are fond of saying social practices are the basic unit of society. And the more radical version of that is saying it's not people and it's not it's not systems, like it's practices. Practices are the things that are reproducing themselves. So there was this paper by Alan Ward at one point, a consumer theorist, and he said, well, if you're really into... Um, making cars go faster, you know, hot rodding. You know, if you're somebody who's kind of an like a DIY auto mechanic and you love cars and you, he says at some point that person will go out and buy a new carburetor or, you know, a new exhaust system. But he says, but it's not, it's not the person doing that. Like they are just doing what the practice tells them is the next thing to do. It's the practice that wants the carburetor. The person is just the vehicle for the practice. Now, it's a, it's a provocative claim, but it's really useful for just recognising that practice theory is attempting to decenter human agency and recognise how much kind of ritual and habit and material products that are steering us with their affordances are the thing that we are trying to change. Mm. And that is the same thing as Max Neef saying, you can't pull the need away from its satisfier. You can't pull the meaning away from the skills and the practice. Mm -hmm. You can read a practice as being a constellation of affects, qualities, you know, what Shatsky calls teleoeffective qualities, the kind of when you know you've done it well, like this was a good breakfast and I've made a good hot rod today. And, you know, like there's this quality but that quality is inseparable from the things. I use the tools well, and I use the tools well because I'm skilled. So they go together. It's sort of stupid that they're always presented as three things. They really go together in the same way that a need is not an abstract need that can be satisfied by lots of things. It's a, it's a practice. It's a, a conjunction of needs and satisfiers and, and skills and meanings. And so the actuary needs to actuary um not not because they have some need for power or affect but in a weird way because everything when they arrive in the environment everything is about actuaring and there's something really pleasant in the chick sent me high way of going with the flow you know so i think you're absolutely right to draw the connection between those and that transition design is trying to say this is the stuff of change this is what you want to change so that we're less um uh, you know, uh, climate destroying if, if, if so that we're less inequitable if you want to make those big changes it's unfortunately just tons of work with all these different systems coordinating those changes 
and not just telling them, but uh, as Marla just indicated, working with them. Thank you. Can I just check? This was Ellen Wan you mentioned. How do you spell? Uh, Alan Ward. I can send you the article. W A R D E. So he's a yeah, he's a consumer theorist who's written a couple of books about social practice theory. But it's this little article he wrote about what does practice theory do to consumption theory, and what it does is say that the consumption is being done by the practice, not by the person. And he's just got that provocation to say, if you're trying to do sustainable consumption, you can't just harangue people to, like, consume differently because they're consuming because the practice, you have to give them different ways of practicing. Mm -hmm. It was from years ago, like 20 years ago. Uh, Alex? Uh, right. So I have a question about the concept of relevance within uh, systems thinking. It's kind of um, so this is one of the problems with systems thinking that we encountered before is that once you start mapping the system, like where do you stop? Right. Yeah. So this is also related to the graph that you showed and, uh, and the idea of like adjacent colons, right, of yeah. kind of eating like in that particular world, eating was adjacent to uh, yep. commuting into something else yeah but there is the also idea of something unexpected happening as being quite revealing and instrumental to the changing of the system yep. right so like the like there is an interesting passage within rhythm analysis by lefevre when he uh talks about the difference between the repetitive rhythm of like the thing you do on a daily basis yep. and kind of the cyclical things. He uses the example of a call to prayer or yep. uh, like seasonal change. And looking at that interaction is what can reveal something about the system. But in a more kind of down to earth way, uh, what are the good approaches to arranging holons in the way that nearby holons are actually the most relevant and connect, right? Because that is kind of quite unclear yep. once you start doing it. Yeah. You know, so Indy Young's book is, and Indy Young's work in general is um, almost ethnographic in its commitment to being told by the people who are doing the practice what are the adjacent practices. So you you ask them and you ask them, and you don't have to ask a large number because the social practice, the hypothesis is we all, not we all, but many of us more or less breakfast the same way because the society has reproduced that version. So if you talk to a couple of breakfasters, they will tend to lay out the adjacent practices. And so the answer is kind of boring, like just ask people. Um, and and the, again, the trick as a designer is that you're doing a job on breakfast, but you're, you're asking them about the adjacent practices as well, which takes some skill to make them think it's relevant. And then the last one is that when I said it, the trick that one of the tricks is finding sort of things that you wouldn't normally consider to be adjacent, which actually impact the system. So I kind of says like a third dimension thing that seems to be a disturbance. In my experience, it's not for you to find those things. Again, you you hear them, you listen them. And it, they pop up either in the first things an interviewer says before you've turned on the recording machine and got yourself settled down and you're just doing banter, or it's the thing they say afterwards as you're kind of leaving. So it's a bit like saying, you know, you go and you have an interview with someone about how they use a particular service, government service, and then as you're walking out, they tell you that their dog's sick and, you know, that suddenly realise they don't have health insurance for their dog and they love their dog. And you're doing something completely different, but you you now realise that there's something disturbing them and their whole relation to this government service is about to be messed up, not because of the government service, but because their life is about to take this financial disastrous turn as they spend a fortune on a dog just to give it another six months life. And it, it becomes this moment at which you're just kind of thinking, Ah, oh, there's there's something else going on. There's a totally different financial pressure which can arrive. So it's just an anecdote to say when I say often these distant planets can still 
big gravitational impact on the systems and their nested reproductions. It's not for you to find, though sometimes you can suggest them and, and a good transition designer is listening out for them, but it's particularly in that ethnographic way that you suddenly get told these things. Um, when, when everyone thinks you've stopped listening and even you, you kind of, like the weird thing is you almost have to stop listening for them to feel free to start telling. And then uh, as you leave, you're suddenly thinking, that was, that was interesting. They suddenly started talking about fruit and vitamin intakes and we were talking about something. But, you know, like I'm just trying to think of silly examples. But so that, that's that's my tip. Again, being a great designer is being a really attentive person uh, to these things. Yeah. It, it, it may also come up materially as well. You may find a poster. You may find yeah. something left in the road. Yeah. You may find people organizing something else after your time is supposed yeah. to be finished yeah. and they come to do something. Um, so it's usually in the periphery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's usually, yeah. it, I, I explain it as a constellation. Sometimes we're looking at these maps and they're looking at the systems from one point of view, but if you yeah. move and you ha change perspective, you have these two things that are probably far away looking near that you call it planets still but yeah. I, yeah no no that's a, that, that's a beautiful point yeah that's exactly right and it's nice great to indicate yes that it's sometimes materially present it's it's also kind of like things that you need to be attentive in relation to intersectionality you're interviewing somebody about something and then you realize there's a totally different aspect to them or, you know, transitions in people that you realise you're talking to somebody because you think of something and they were something completely different beforehand or at the same time. And those are also, yeah, when when other possibilities become available. So, um, so it's it's 30 already. Um, I, I'm hoping to respect everyone's time and um, just want to thank everyone for coming today and for participating for all the questions and thank you Cameron really for the generosity um, for putting the time into sharing all, um, all of this with us and then for future sessions as well. Um, for can, anyone can, I who, say, can I just say, can I just say, I'm really excited but I'm really terrified for you that on the basis of just what I've incoherently mumbled on these two evenings, you're now going to go and start experimenting. So I, I, I realise that there must be some, maybe not, but trepidation about doing that. But I'm really, uh, because I haven't, I've just seen the little abstracts that you've done. I'm so excited to see how you reinterpret the things we've been talking about and and just have a go. And I really want you to, to encourage you to be as um, experimental as you possibly can, because that that's where I'm going to start to learn from you. So, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Amy. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, um, and and also, uh, can some of us were discussing that we could potentially have another call as well, just to talk about how we could best share back what we are experimenting with, like what kind of format works. Um, we can we can schedule that um, another time and arrange over Slack. Okay. Um, yeah, but yeah, for everyone else, yeah. Uh, if anything else comes up for you, please feel free to use our Miro or Slack to, to post questions or comments or thoughts. Um, uh, even if you have any requests or offers as well, please feel free to, to bring that into this group. We are quite open to things. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, for the students, and, and actually this is open for everyone. Um, some of us are planning to also have a debrief session after this, another 30 minutes. We will do a 10 minute break first and then meet back again to just talk about what's, what 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 is this for us um so you're welcome to join um but otherwise uh let's say this is the end of this session and the next one would be um let me check the next session is going to be on the um 20th of september so um yeah if you know of anyone interested uh in transition design please feel free to also invite them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good, good, good luck experimenting. <laughs> Take care. Bye. And for those of us staying for the debrief, um,
yeah, 10 minute break and let's come back here 45, 45. Okay, see you all soon.